Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tracy and James, for that very kind introduction. Uh, I'm delighted today to be here to present on behalf of Chagisk uh, in relation to new proteins and the implications that they have for um, allergic consumers. So I suppose if we just look at why um, there is a need and why there is a growth in the whole area of novel proteins and new proteins, well, it largely relates to our growing global population, as James mentioned. And at this point, it's largely accepted that by 2050, the global population will reach circa 10 billion people. So that's a lot of mouths to feed. Now, currently, um, the global protein supply is derived primarily from animal protein sources. And by animal protein sources, I include dairy and meat, but also eggs and fish sources. And this provides about 18% of the global calorie value currently. Um, we actually, as a world, I suppose, really love animal proteins. So much so that last year we consumed about 574 million metric tons worth of meat, fish, dairy and eggs. And that equates to about 75 kgs of animal protein per person. But as much as we love animal source protein, um, there, the growth and concern around um, how animal protein is produced, animal welfare, envir environmental concerns and so on, uh, that's actually going faster. And this is why alternative proteins, which were more niche in the past, have now morphed into the mainstream. And we see this every day as consumers, if we, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, if we go into a supermarket, it's now quite easy to pick up plant milks. Um, now there is some controversy over whether they can be called milks or not in Europe, but you know, it's, it's easy to get oat milk in your, your, your latte, for example, in Starbucks. Um, in other parts of the world, then there is a, a growth in, in alternative meat products through a growth of meat in labs. And you can get lab grown meat in, in, in restaurants in Israel and Singapore, for example. And even here in Ireland and in the UK, we can pick up seaweed and pea drive burgers. So the alternative meat sector is growing all the time. And it's predicted that by 2035, we'll actually consume about 97 million metric tons of alternative proteins. And also it, it's said that nine out of 10 of the, the global hot dishes um, will actually be developed using no meat at all. So it is a growing market and it's becoming mainstream. Now, I mentioned some of the drivers, largely the, the drive towards alternative proteins and their use um, relates to Millennials and Generation Z, and I'm a bit of a millennium myself, but you know I still like animal proteins. Um, and the concerns there relate to environmental costs, but not just environmental costs, but more um, the energy it takes uh, and terrestrial land mass it takes to produce a ton of animal protein. So, for example, a ton of animal protein it usually requires around 35 hectares of land um, to produce one ton of animal derived protein, and this equates to uh, 10, 10 hectares of land are required to produce a uh, plant source protein. Um, so like if we continue to just consume animal protein sources, it, there won't be enough to feed everyone. That's the primary concern. So food security is a big driver as well. Um, along with that, human health um, is, a, is a driver. Um, most people presume that animal protein sources uh, have a negative health impact. Um, and that plant is immediately healthy. Uh, and there's some truth to that, but there's also untruths there. Um, and there is a growing vegan movement and flexitarian movement. But interestingly enough, about 50% of demand for alternatives to dairy protein arise from uh, people who have allergies and require alternatives to dairy and soy. So it's not just all about meat uh, substitution. Uh, in, in addition to this, uh, we are becoming more aware of the need to not waste resources. So a lot of products are being derived from byproducts or co-products of main processing. So if we take, for example, in the marine environment in, in which I work, um, byproducts are being used to develop new ingredients. Uh, for example, we have this Kit Kat product that's produced, you know, sold in Japan. 
and it actually contains uh, seaweed flavors derived from uh, byproducts of uh, shrimp processing. So alternative proteins, I suppose, they don't just relate to meat and dairy substitutes. They can be derived from a lot of plant resources and insect resources as well. And some examples include pulses, pea protein, nut protein, uh, quinoa, insect protein, and seaweed and uh, microalgal or algal derived proteins as well. In also you have plants like lupins uh, and hemp, which are growing as well. But I show here an alternative protein market map and the different areas, I suppose, that alternative proteins are, are, are targeted at and the companies that are involved in the development uh, of these um, alternative protein markets. So, for example, you have dairy substitutes, meat substitutes, you have insect protein, and there's a, a demand for that. Um, seaweed substitutes, algal protein substitutes, uh, mushroom protein, egg substitutes, chickpea protein, and animal-free gelatin. And I suppose three things that are very important to consider um, when developing an alternative protein for either a feed or food use uh, would be the cost. It obviously has to be cost effective and comparable to traditional protein sources, how that protein is derived. Um, you have to have a sustainable, sustainable supply of the protein, obviously, and you also have to ensure the safety of the protein. So I suppose that's where food allergy comes in. Um, a lot of people are aware of dairy protein intolerances and dairy allergies but they may not be as aware of um, novel protein allergies. So for example, what is allergy? So food allergy really uh, relates to an adverse human reaction to uh, a food allergen, which is usually a, a protein. And it involves two stages. The first stage is sensitization and the second is elicitation. So sensitization basically occurs when the food protein uh, is presented to the sensitive person um, IgE, IgE antibodies are produced and uh, they link onto cells and this causes the person to become sensitized. Then on re-exposure to that same protein or allergen, um, the person then releases mediators of, that, of an allergic reaction. So these would be things like histamine, proteases uh, and other things. Now the incidence of food allergy is really growing um, in the West and by the West, I mean developed um, society. Okay, so um, in the UK and Ireland, about 7% of children are known to have a food allergy. Uh, in Australia, it's about 9%. And across Europe, adults, um, the incidence is about 2% of adults in Europe uh, have a known food allergy. So things such as environmental conditions can impact on, on the occurrence of, of allergy. Um, pollution, um, less exposure to microbes and increased hygiene can also have an impact. Um, dietary intake of vitamin D has been linked to an increased occurrence. But a main thing, I suppose, would be our changing diets. And also not just the type of protein that we're consuming, but also how our food is processed can have an impact on it. So if we take processing, for example, uh, processing can have either a negative or a, a potentially beneficial effect on allergy. Um, and I suppose how a consumer uh, relates to a protein. Um, if we look at things like fermentation and hydrolysis, which employ lactic acid bacteria and different enzymes, um, they, there's some evidence to suggest that fermentation and hydrolysis can actually reduce the incidence of allergenicity in the consumer to the point where an allergic uh, response is not elicited. Um, if we take soy milk, for example, a study carried out previously has, with lactic acid bacteria where the soy milk was fermented with these uh, lactic acid bacteria, the incidence of Ig immune reactivity in patients allergic to soy allergens was greatly reduced um, when the soy was fermented, as opposed to when they just consumed soy milk um, without any fermentation. Uh, things like heating can also affect allergenicity. For example, egg white uh, allergy, aller, allergy occurs due to two pro, some proteins that are found in egg whites, um, the ovomucoids and, uh, and others. And the protein can be broken down by heat and therefore a, a lesser, uh, allergen, lesser allergenic potential is found. In terms of peanuts, uh, which are probably the most widely recognized uh, cause of food allergy, 
uh, and they're known to have at least 13 um, uh, proteins that cause a, an allergenic effect in, in consumers. Um, different processing can also affect uh, the impact, I suppose, of consuming those peanut proteins. So, for example, if we boil protein or peanuts, um, you can actually denature the allergenic proteins and they can be transferred to the cooking water. Uh, these proteins are usually low molecular weight proteins and there is uh, the potential to cause a decrease in the allergic uh, response to peanuts uh, in this manner. However, if we take another process through processing method, roasting peanuts, for example, can really increase allergenicity um, because due to the Maillard reaction, uh, the IgE binding potential of the proteins is increased almost 90 fold. Now, how does this, this relate to novel proteins? Well, things like uh, pea protein, you can find pea protein in a lot of products nowadays. Uh, for example, they're found in vegan cheeses and yogurts, and they're also used um, as meat substitutes. So if you have a peanut allergy, I would be very wary of consuming uh, pea protein. Um, a study carried out by a Canadian doctor found that about 5% of people who have a peanut allergy can actually um, experience life-threatening anaphylaxis uh, following consumption of pea products containing pea protein. Okay, um, so, you know, I would be very wary of consuming pea protein, for example, if you have a nut allergy. Alternative proteins from algal sources, and by algae, I mean seaweeds and microalgae, uh, they're really growing uh, currently, and it's predicted that we will be consuming a lot of these algal proteins in the future. And indeed, it, uh, the use of algal protein is seen as an important source of alternative proteins uh, for sustainable uh, proteins, you know, in the future by the EU, and it forms part of the EU farm to fork strategy. But consumption of algal proteins isn't a new thing. Uh, for example, uh, in the 12th century here in Ireland, we, the monks, the Irish monks distributed dulce palmaria palmata to the poor as alms, okay? And palmaria palmata is a very rich source of protein. It can contain up to 47% protein on a dry weight basis. So there is potential for developing food ingredients from this algal source. And indeed, other seaweed proteins are very rich in uh, other seaweeds are also very rich in, in protein, uh, mainly the red and the green seaweeds. Now here I show uh, a, basically a, a table that shows that most uh, seaweeds contain between 11 and 47% protein on a dry weight basis. And if we compare that to dairy protein, which contains, you know, 3 to 4.5% protein is found in cow's milk. It is an excellent source of protein. It's an excellent source of, of uh, calcium and other vitamins and minerals. And in terms of protein quality, it can be compared to leguminous plants and egg white protein, uh, which you know, are considered excellent sources of protein as well. And we see seaweeds now in products such as uh, this Irish company, company um, produces a seaweed burger, you know, where the, the burger is actually uh, made using seaweed proteins. In terms of allergy and seaweeds, some components with found in certain seaweeds are actually known to reduce the allergic effect uh, of, of um, different proteins. Uh, polysaccharides from this red seaweed, uh, Gracilaria, um, have been shown to cause, you know, a less, a less of an allergic reaction uh, to major shellfish allergens, such as tropomycin, previously in some studies. Other algae then include things like microalgae. So microalgae uh, can contain between 30 and 60% protein on a dry weight basis. And companies such as Nestle have teamed up with algal producers because this is really seen as the, the future. A large focus in relation to microalgae protein is on the spirulina and chlorella vulgaris uh, species. And the reason for this is because they're not considered novel foods because they were consumed in significant quantities prior to May 15th, 1997. Um, so they're on the approved uh, novel food regulations list. Uh, we work as well in the IDEA project on deriving food ingredients from different microalgae uh, that can be grown in Northwestern Europe. So they're known to be a great source of protein. They have functional properties that can help to mimic egg protein, for example, and some companies like uh, the French company uh, Good Foods, they produce a, a mayonnaise substitute product using microalgae proteins from chlorella. However, there is some concerns around the allergenicity of chlorella proteins as well. 
And this paper from 1985 actually um, demonstrated that uh, chlorella can cause allergy in young children. In terms of novel proteins from insects, which is a, a, you know, really seen as a, a growth market, and there are a lot of companies investing in this area currently. Um, the yellow mealworm, for example, was approved recently by the EU uh, Food Safety Agency um, as a, a protein source, and insects have been approved for consumption across Europe. Now, in other um, cultures, they have been consumed long before this, so you know it's not again new. However, in terms of food safety, um, people who may have a shrimp allergy should be wary of consuming foods containing um, mealworm protein. And the reason for this is because of uh, the um, tr tropomyosin uh, protein, which is the known allergenic protein in, sh in shrimp. And this is also found in mealworms. So, you know, again, you should be cautious if you do suffer from uh, shellfish uh, allergies uh, of consuming food products made using um, mealworm protein. So I suppose my point is that novel foods are, novel proteins are, you know, needed because of our growing global population. Um, we need a sust sustainable supply of, of food protein because it helps to drive us forward and it's essential for um, our diet and we can't, we have to consume it. Um, to get our essential amino acids. However, um, in terms of getting a novel protein approved uh, within Europe, EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, take a weight of evidence approach to determine if a novel protein um, you know, can actually cause an allergy. So the protein must obviously not either sensitize a person or induce a new allergy or elicit an allergic response in an already allergic population. So to decipher whether a novel protein has potential to cause allergy, um, we have to look at the protein itself and we have to examine the physical and chemical properties of the protein. We have to develop in vitro methods to determine if these novel proteins have the potential to cause allergy. We also have to look in vivo to determine if a person reacts to novel proteins and we obviously have to do risk assessment and uh, you know, a get the clinical per perspective on it. So in terms of what we can do in the lab to decipher if a novel protein may cause an allergy, um, we can look at things like the sequence of the protein. So to do this, we can use in silk or computer-based methods where we can determine whether a novel protein has sequence alignment uh, with known allergen, allergen causing proteins, okay? And this is actually, this in silico method is actually recommended by the FAO. And we published a paper back, I think it was in uh, 2019, um, as part of the Paris cost action, which looked at the allergenicity of novel proteins um, on the use of in silico tools and computer-based methods to examine uh, proteins for potential to cause human allergy. Um, we also then look at the physical chemical uh, composition of the protein um, and digestion of the protein. So we have in vitro methods such as the InfoGest method, which mimics um, the uh, digestion in the gut, which we can apply to novel proteins. And then we can assess whether the protein is broken down by pepsin. Um, and if, if it's not broken down by pepsin, the enzyme, it's likely to cause a, an allergy. Um, we then also can use animal models to determine uh, whether the protein can cause allergy. And um, basically one of the best methods is to compare your, your protein sequence with known proteins that cause allergy. So there are very useful tools available online um, to help us determine uh, if a novel protein has potential to cause allergy. Um, Allergen Online, which is a, a database hosted by the University of Nebraska in the US, basically puts together a peer-reviewed allergen list. And you can then, once you know the sequence of your protein, you can compare that sequence to known allergens. And if you get a matches of over 80% um, within a 35 amino acid sequence, it's, it's thought that your protein can be an allergen. So this is a very useful method to help us identify allergens, but also uh, proteins that can cause intolerances as well. Obviously, in terms of labeling, um, there are 14 major allergens that are known and companies have to, you know, make consumers aware of, of that um, and to put this on their labels. 
um, under EU law. So the food has to be safe. Um, so if a novel food is intended to replace another food as well, it also has to offer the consumer um, a similar nutritional benefit and it can't dis disadvantage the consumer. And it, an important here is the protein quality. So it's well accepted that um, dairy and egg protein sources are excellent protein sources basically. Um, and when we're looking at novel proteins, we don't always know the value of that protein in terms of the nutritional benefit to the consumer. So uh, what's used by industry is the protein, um, the PD-CAS method, the uh, protein-directed uh, corrected amino acid score system. And this is a measure, this method is a measure of the amino acid composition, but also the digestibility of the protein. More recently, it has been replaced by the DS method um, to determine protein quality. But basically, it's a, it's a method that determines whether uh, your, it, your protein source contains all the essential amino acids, so all nine, what, what, what amino acids are limiting, and also how digestible those uh, proteins are. So if you have a value close to one, it's considered an excellent source of protein, and others are, are lesser, you know, and may not be as excellent. So um, for novel protein sources from algae, for example, we have to do this work uh, going forward. So that if we're including um, a novel protein from algae into foodstuffs, we must ensure that it is not um, providing a disadvantage nutritionally to the consumer. So you want to be as close to one as possible in relation to this. So uh, that really is it for me today. Um, and thank you for your attention. I'd just like to acknowledge and point you towards other sites which could be useful. Um, the Emparis website, which was a cost action, which looked at um, novel proteins and allergenicity of the human consumer to these proteins. U Protein Project, which we have in Chagas, which is funded by DAFM, and which, uh, in which we're looking at different protein sources um, and their potential to use as food ingredients. But obviously we're also looking at the safety of those ingredients. And then the Bioalgae Project, an idea project funded by um, the EU. So many thanks for your attention and I look forward to hearing your questions. Okay, thanks very much, Maria. Uh, folks, I would encourage you to submit your questions uh, via the chat function at the bottom of the screen. And we'll uh, get to those uh, at the end of both presentations. So I'll move on out to Hazel. Hazel, can you upload your presentation, please? Okay, you're muted. Uh, ah, yep, there you are. I'm in, I think. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Is that okay, James? Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. And thank you very much to Safe Food for inviting me to deliver this presentation. Um, I come at similar subjects from a very, very different angle, and I'm very thankful to Maria for the systematic um, presentation and understanding of the uh, subject area in particular that I've come to really as a, as a consumer and a consumer advocate. Um, so we're looking to the future and that is my crystal ball on the horizon. And I'm starting with, uh, particularly for allergenicity, uh, new pollen cross reactivities. Uh, you may know that in more northerly countries, uh, there's already an issue with significant food allergy cross reactivity with things like birch pollen, where we have birch trees and also um, alder and hazel. So the, I think it's the BET V1 protein um, means that certain people have cross-reactive food allergies, um, particularly from raw foods such as apple and various berries and cherries and things like raw carrot and raw celery. With um, global warming, the, uh, the plants which grow further south, more close to the, say for example in Europe in, near the Mediterranean, um, some of those, for example, ragweed, um, are moving north with global warming and the food allergies which are cross-reactive with them are starting to show. So if you've got the birch pollen with the catkins, you've got this cross-reactivity with apples. 
But then further south, you've got uh, ragweed, which can cause really uh, severe um, uh, allergic reactions and cross reactive with things like peaches and lentils. So that's our first challenge, that allergy is moving with the plants with which it cross reacts. Then we've got an issue to do with reducing food waste generally. Um, and from the allergic person's point of view and probably most other people's, uh, maintaining the integrity of the food. So if you're going to, if you like, represent food, then you need to know what it was and where's it been. Um, you need the information about it to be correct. And also we now have a new issue, which is that uh, biodegradable packaging can be made from things processed from food. These are just three headlines on a um, food industry uh, news email. So let's turn hazelnut shells into vanillin. Uh, let's upcycle shrimp waste to um, use as a different flavoring. And this is uh, a milk-based biodegradable um, packaging product that people are developing. Now, these things are all laudable provided somebody is doing the uh, allergenicity risk assessment. And that's why I'm so reassured that at least Maria and her colleagues are recognizing the potential for risk to people with food hypersensitivity. But bright ideas to reuse things need to take this into account. And then we've got just generally new foods, foods that we've not necessarily had um, much of before, we've rarely used. Um, in, in the uh, Irish UK diet, um, things like jackfruit may not have been widely used, buckwheat, very common in the Far East. And regional allergies are changing because people are eating different foods. So this is jackfruit, which has got a, a texture which can make it really suitable for things like burgers, so plant-based burgers. Uh, this is buckwheat. Now, in countries where it is widely consumed, such as Japan and Korea, it is top of their list of allergenic uh, foods that have to be labelled. And of course, coconut, which we've always eaten, and it's, as you know, not a nut in the true tree nut sense requiring labelling, but um, it is widely used. There are some people who are allergic to it. And also using it in different forms um, where uh, it might not be expected means that, uh, and of course, because it's not on the 14 list, it doesn't get exceptionally labelled or highlighted, but it's showing up in a lot of um, plant-based meat alternatives, for example. Um, and then there's gene editing, which is way beyond my knowledge and experience, and Maria is the expert here for this. But as you've just seen, this needs risk assessing for allergenicity and is the responsibility, well, ultimately in Europe of the Commission and uh, the UK Novel Food Assessment System. So ingredients processing, well, isolates have been a word. This is a French article about isolat de blé, which is wheat isolates, which about 10 years ago were causing a problem because the wheat on its own was, people could consume it without any trouble. But the way it had been made into an isolate and it had some functionality, I think mostly in pizzas, as you can see from the picture, um, meant that people who could normally eat it were having terrible reactions. And these were being picked up by um, doctors in London who did an investigation. And when the food is processed, it really needs to be reassessed because you can't just label it as what it started out as because it actually needs to be checked for its character totally changing. And you can see isolates are very much a thing of the moment. There's a pea protein isolate. And I just don't know what the impact will be on people who are uh, likely to be uh, having allergic reactions, whether they're allergic to that food already or not. Another impact is um, exercise on top of the food. So the food on its own might be fine, the exercise on its own might be fine, but put the two together, you have symptoms. And then as we just saw, far better presented than this, uh, insects and other new food sources need to be risk assessed. This is a paper about shellfish allergy and cricket anaphylaxis, and there is a cricket-based uh, snack. So 
Uh, beyond the 14 allergens, um, particularly on the increase amongst the members of the anaphylaxis campaign, for example, as a population of people with food allergy, um, all the legumes, so chickpeas, lentils, all the beans, kiwi has always been an issue, partly because it's in that uh, birch pollen uh, cross-reactivity. Um, bananas have always been an issue to some degree. Um, but then particularly peas, and these are Marks and Spencer uh, oven bake chips, and they've got pea flour in them, which I guess gives them some protein and some kind of crunchiness. But of course, you might not expect to find pea flour on your chips. And there's now a hashtag on Twitter, for example, with the allergic families where they've been caught out by peas again in the place that they weren't expecting them. So um, the issues with plant-based foods generally are to do with using allergenic ingredients, misleading food hypersensitive consumers, and possibly also the nutritional value of such foods. Um, here's this pea protein again. Um, and then the names of things, because when you're food hypersensitive, what things are called really matters. And you really need to know that what you're getting is what you think you're getting. And then there's also the nutritional aspect. So here it says, you know, one in four meat substitutes don't contain enough protein. Um, the anaphylaxis campaign has raised this issue because if you are um, a not very confident, not very assertive person with a cow's milk hypersensitivity, particularly food allergy, um, then it's it's sort of easier if you're a bit shy to say, well, I'll just have the vegan option. And vegan is being used, um, perhaps wrongly, as code for uh, guaranteed parts per million uh, milk protein free. And that may not be the case, not least because of the production methods. So people need to communicate better on this subject and also recognize that some consumers who don't want to make a big fuss might just choose vegan where they actually are looking for something without any milk, really seriously without any milk. So here is a label of a jackfruit burger catering pack, which I found in a freezer. And there are lots of issues here, but um, the first one is that it's got 136 words. Now, one thing I know about training caterers is that reading is not something that they really want to do too much of. And that's a lot of reading to identify things that people may or may not have been looking for before. It's got jackfruit, kidney beans, buck, buckwheat, uh, black turtle beans and butter beans hidden in there somewhere. And it's also got along the bottom and may contain, now apart from the fact that it's a dreadful label that's creased and around the corner of the cardboard box, um, it doesn't actually have any highlighted 14 allergens, but it's a very, very complicated sort of uh, complex product. And when you eat that, that's just the burger. That's not the bun, the salad, the chips, etc. That's just one part of the meal. And lookalike meat is a bit of an issue uh, because, of course, the technologists devising these products are trying to make them do all the things that real meat does, like grill nicely and look good in a burger like that. But I do use this photo just to remind everybody that um, that's actually a chair. And this is Professor Chris Elliott talking about the um, nutrition, the bioavailability of some of these nutrients, which may look as though they're officially there, but are not necessarily um, from sources that are going to give you that nutrition. Um, this is another concern. People with um, food allergy, food hypersensitivity, um, typically are what we call atopic. They're allergic people. Many of them also have asthma. This is a paper from researchers in Canada and Sweden looking at plant-based diet for children. And there's a risk of nutritional deficiencies, particularly during childhood. Um, and things like asthma, conditions like asthma, which are very uh, common with uh, food allergy, uh, may mean that you need additional energy and nutrient requirements compared with other, other children. Um, 
and these may be limited by this diet. So dietary variety may suffer and you might have to eat more um, due to the reduced bioavailability of the nutrients. And they particularly did, um, I think, blood testing on these children um, and found that these things might be compromised. And they're all more abundant in animal versus plant foods. So we need to look at nutrition as well. Um, Dr. Isabel Skipler is a research dietitian at Imperial in London, and she sees a lot of um, food allergic adult patients. And therefore, she's picking up, if you like, what's on the horizon um, in her population of patients. And of course, she's identified this food anaphylaxis risk with um, health and fitness regimes that people are adopting and also a kind of lifestyle um, culture with um, health giving uh, properties of certain diets and exercise and particularly looking at the meat substitutes, the wheat substitutes and also various sort of supplements and uh, the sort of things you might put in a smoothie. Um, and some of the ingredients have now been confirmed as a cause of allergic reactions. Some of them are maybe technically not novel, but they're relatively um, uh, less uh, used. Um, and also what we also know from other research at Imperial and um, in Cambridge is that exercise can exacerbate your allergic symptoms. Um, looking here at uh, fatal reactions to food in the UK, this is 92 to 2018, you can see on the left there are children and on the right there are adults, so children under 16. It is a significant concern at the bottom of the left hand circle that the blue is cow's milk protein, so a quarter of the children who have died from food allergy um, died from cow's milk protein and also the orange, 29%, we don't know what they died from. We, we know it looked like food allergy, but we're not sure. And even in the adults, 5% of the adults have died from cow's milk protein allergy. And there have been some quite significant cases recently. So this is a very vulnerable population, um, a population that people don't expect because people are focused on nuts and peanuts and the traditional story, if you like. But cow's milk protein allergy, uh, is far more likely to kill you if you have it than a nut or a peanut allergy. And we must remember also that milk is a, is a much, is a, is a cheap protein, is a ubiquitous protein, uh, is in both powder and, if you like, liquid and possibly even aerosol form in many food environments. And people who are cow's milk protein allergic have seem to be having a lot more reactions. So they need protecting. So their use of the term vegan to indicate what they want might not be good enough. And the food and hospitality sectors need to recognize that this is an issue. But also they're the same people that are looking for, as Maria pointed out, the alternative um, uh, products that will replace milk such as almond, rice, and Maria had some similar products as well. Now this is all good, but we have to remember that milk is a four letter word. It's an easy word to write, to recognize in, in English. And uh, we can't really have it borrowed by these other products because it, it's a legal word that we need, particularly for this vulnerable group of people who need to be able to identify it on products. It must not cause any confusion. Um, this is just a little extra story. A couple of weeks ago, somebody had uh, anaphylaxis apparently to honey. I don't know what component of honey that was uh, triggered by, but that's a, a, a story. Um, and lastly, um, we're looking at reducing water use with climate change. Water is increasingly precious, even in places where we feel it's abundant. Um, and the impact on washing and cleaning regimes, I mean, already we've got our domestic washing machines and dishwashers trying to reduce water consumption. And we need to consider uh, also in uh, commercial cleaning and washing up and so on, um, the impact on 
um, allergen removal, particularly for PAL, pre precautionary allergy labelling, which is may contain labelling. So will that mean that the washing up is not good enough? That needs to be constantly reviewed and assessed. So both in dishwashing and in factory environments, reduced water use and perhaps reusing rinse water needs to be reassessed to make sure that the um, allergens have been removed and controlled in the way you would hope. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Hazel, and thank you, Maria. That was an excellent uh, presentations, two excellent presentations actually with plenty of food for thought. Folks, uh, I would encourage you to submit your uh, questions over either, either the Q&A or the chat function at the bottom of the screen. We've had a number of questions already. Um, there's one here uh, with respect to assessing the risk. Does the EU document the specific tests or threats or is that up to the industry to decide? not just with respect to allergens, uh, but any chemical risk, although it's pretty clear that allergens should be high on the priority list. Um, Maria, can I go to you? <laughs> yeah, so sorry, I, I wrote something in the chat there, Simon, to answer your question as well, but just to say that, yeah, EFSA have guidance documents on what tests to carry out in relation to uh, determining whether something could potentially be an allergen and um, the guidance documents relate to uh, genetically modified plants, which under which uh, protein potential protein allergenicity um, is also governed. So they have some recommendations in relation to in vitro protein digestibility tests and uh, and things like that. Right. And um, this question here: Do you, Hazel? Do you want to come in on that one or? No, I have nothing well, else. I, That's not my expertise. Okay. Uh, do you think there will be more allergens added to the 14 named allergens soon? Oh, dear. <laughs> so the 14 legislated food allergens, do you think that list is going to go up or down? Um, I don't know. I think that the list as it stands is not representative of the... Um, populations that we know of, um, you know, UK and Ireland, um, we have obviously uh, the, the peanuts, tree nuts, milk, egg, etc. But then more obscure things like uh, celery, I think, um, is not a huge issue at the moment. Um, mustard is not a huge issue. But I do remember I was involved when they first devised the concept of having a list when, you know, working with the commission at the time. And um, we did have a principle that that list could be uh, extended or reduced if evidence arose that would support that. The thing is that it's become part of the culture now. And, you know, we have, rightly or wrongly, we now have uh, a lot of, if you like, industry dependent on that list staying as it is and, and import and export and all the rest of it about food. So to change it would have to be justified. I think uh, the next food that numerically would go on there would be kiwi, but I don't think kiwi is causing a big problem because usually people know that they're eating kiwi. It's not hidden. It's not, it, unless somebody devises a kiwi powder that's like seaweed or something that you kind of hide in food, then I don't think kiwi is going to be an issue. So uh, there are people who would lobby for other foods to be added, but I think it's, um, it's, it, it needs the evidence base. It needs the evidence that it's, that an individual food is actually causing a significant problem to change the law. And then you just think about the impact on industry labeling and all the rest of it. I always, always advocate that people should be allowed to ask about any ingredient if they need to. And that information should be available from at least the manufacturer. So that case means that highlighting it, you've just got to work a bit harder if it's not highlighted, but it should be there. Yeah. I mean, just, just because just because the food isn't on the list doesn't mean that somebody, you know, needs to avoid it. I mean, if somebody has an, an allergy to, to beef, for instance, we, we had a yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. presentation once, she, had a, she went into anaphylaxis four times as a teenager because she has an, had an allergy to beef. Yeah. Now, it's not on the list, but nonetheless, she yeah. really needs to avoid that 
uh, or that particular food. Uh, just on that note, Hazel, I think the Codex Alimentarius had an expert committee looking at that the the list, uh, the general worldwide list um, recently, and um, so it'll be interesting to see what they've concluded. Well, I think I saw yesterday, but I might not be right. Um, I think I saw that soya's off and sesame's on. Yeah, and something like that. And, and I think that they more or less said that there would be a lot of local allergens or, or allergenic yes, foods that exactly. were problematic locally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, beef, but of course, beef, then, how long does it take? Yeah. How long does it take for that to make its way into legislation then? Yeah. Well, well, beef <laughs> exactly. has been a problem in, um, in uh, Eastern Europe longer. Than, you know, there's regional uh, differences. Yeah. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what is the legislation on descriptions for non-dairy drinks now? I thought describing oat drinks, etc., as milk uh, was no longer permitted, though I see milk is still used sometimes. Thank you. Oh, I think that uh, the jury is still out on it. <laughs> um, and until everything is agreed, nothing is agreed according to the EU. Oh. Um, I read yesterday that there was a bit of a pushback on the amendment to, uh, or to, uh, you know, amendment 171, um, where, you know, uh, lobby groups like Pro, Pro Veg and that were aiming to get uh, the name like dairy like and creamy and alternative to dairy um, included on um, vegan sources of. of protein or plant sources of protein. So I think the jury is still out on it um, at the moment. And that, I just read that yesterday in, in Food Ingredients, actually it was a, an article that came out uh, just yesterday. So I don't think anything has been decided yet on it. All right. Um, yeah, so, so you could still get things like uh, so, uh, soya milk and stuff on the shelves, can you? Uh, my understanding was that that was removed yeah but then i think that was some sort of pushback is there's there a pushback yeah. yeah so yeah. I, I don't it's very gray i i don't fully understand it at the moment i think that it hasn't been decided legally yet what's oh, allowable right. and what's not <laughs> so right um we have just on that note hazel just some related there was some mention of thresholds for dairy protein in vegan foods How, is that still um a topic for discussion or is it zero tolerance now, with regard, particularly with regard to milk protein? Vegan means nothing. I mean, <laughs> vegan as an, as an adjective, it has no status and it doesn't mean anything at all. Um, and right. I mean, it's upsetting for some people who want a plant-based diet to discover that there's a tiny chance of traces of, of animal protein because of the environment where it's made. And, and that doesn't suit the you know, the, the culture, if you like, but actually scientifically, there, there's no status for the word vegan. Right, which makes it difficult then to, 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 to regulate. Indeed. Yeah. And another question, how do yeast products like Engevita compare? I presume that's from the point of view of, do they, are there something to worry about? Are there, is there cross-reactivity cross with some of the known allergens, etc.? Well, I haven't heard anything. I don't know whether Maria yeah. has. I, I don't know. I suppose you'd have to assess it for us to see. <laughs> um, I haven't heard of any allergies to it, uh, but I could be wrong. Uh, but, you know, you'd have to do the physical analysis of the protein, compare the proteins to known allergens, and then in vivo and, and uh, in vitro testing uh, on it. I suppose that, that raises the question too, uh, Maria. Um, you know, in your presentation, you mentioned some of the approaches being taken, for instance, by the, the multinationals, you know, the Nestle's of this world. Yeah. But if you consider all food businesses, no, not in terms of, of product volume or, or employees, et cetera, but just the total number of food businesses on the island of Ireland, I mean, the vast majority would be considered small, medium-sized, even micro food businesses. And a lot of those, you know, they're, they're, they, they develop their own products. They want to explore, you know, new, new combinations of ingredients and so forth. Is there any, is there any um, information source? I mean, you mentioned there the, uh, the one that, uh, you know, yeah. the protein uh, database. 
held by the University of Nebraska. Yes. Um, but when you're talking about, you know, a, a really small food business, you, you, you know, I don't, I don't think they'd, they'd have necessarily have the time or the expertise to actually start comparing proteins. Where would they get the protein sequence anyway? Is there any other um, resource that they can go to, to, you know, if they want to use a particular ingredient to find out, is there a risk associated with it? Uh, is it something, for instance, um, that they need to consider putting, you know, precautionary allergen labelling on their product because it probably wouldn't be covered under the the labelling legislation? You know, for instance, if they were if they were to use a product, just for the sake of argument, like a a, a powdered protein or you know insect insect yeah. protein uh, for whatever reason in their product. Yeah. Uh, how how would they label for that? I mean, Hazel said, and I think you, you mentioned yourself that could be a risk for people who have um, peanut allergy, peanut allergy yeah, yeah. or, 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 or um, crustacean allergy, for instance, the tropomyosin. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what would you do if you're a small, small, a small business, small food business developing a new product? Is there any? Yeah, well, I suppose what? legally they're required under EU law to ensure it's safe, you know, and there, there is labelling legislation that they have to declare the known allergens. But if it's an unknown allergen, um, I'm not sure, but I suppose they could, you know, if it's assessed, like mealworm protein is known to cause allergy in consumers allergic to peanuts. So I presume they would have to put an advisory on it. Um, legally, I'm not sure, though. But if they had concerns, if you're developing a new product and if, if you want to assess the product, you know, for potential to cause allergy, they can contact places like Tagusk or, you know, the Paris uh, network um, or many of the universities are also involved in that. So, uh, and Safe Food, I'm sure as well, would have guidance on the labeling as would FSAI, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and I suppose in addition to that too, the European Union keeps a database of yes, approved yeah. novel foods, isn't that right? Yes, yeah. Nexus, And then they have all of the information uh, pertaining to each novel food, which yeah. includes I believe, uh, and just an, a determination of the potential allergenicity of the novel food as well. If, exactly, if, yeah. So there are lots of resources, novel. yeah, to, to check it out. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not on the legal side in terms of labelling, so I wouldn't know what they'd have to put on a label. But in terms of if they wanted to assess it for potential, yeah, there is lots of resources like in Paris, the EU, the Allergen Online, which is recognised by the FAO, uh, yeah. you know, for the Encylcoanasis, so, you know, um, they're freely available exactly yeah online. yeah yeah and uh, we have a few other questions here is lupin allergy an issue in other countries uh yes um it's in it's an issue in particularly countries where peanut is widely consumed uh, basically there's a protein in lupin which is a bang on match to one of the potent um peanut proteins um lupin was subsidized and supported in france where there has traditionally been less peanut consumption, but then it started to be cross-reactive. Um, if you like, people started to have reactions and realised that that was an issue, which is how it got put on the list. Right. And sesame, I think, as well. If you have a sesame feed allergy, you should avoid lupin as well, I think. Right. Due to cross-reactivity again? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's no question here if these new protein sources could cause an allergic reaction but are not yet on the list of major allergens that must be declared can we protect the consumer by declaring this and how do we do this for things like insect allergies when it is relatively unknown goes back to the question we we, we just yeah. had i suppose maria again doesn't it exactly yeah you so we know now <laughs> that mealworms <laughs> you know yeah. if you have a shrimp allergy uh you should probably not consume uh mealworm protein containing products because they both contain uh, tropomyosin, which is the allergen, you know, it's one of the proteins that causes allergy um, if you're allergic to shrimp. Uh, so if you consume mealworm protein, you're likely to also uh, have, you know, potential allergic reaction. But, but your best bet is to research your ingredient, go on. Yeah, unfortunately, I suppose, yeah, yeah. until... <laughs> The, yeah. you know, the labeling catches up with what's known yeah. <laughs> and that takes time, as you just said, uh, you have to be very careful. And, and, and the whole area of cross reactivity for allergens anyways is a bit of a minefield anyway, because there, there could be just so many. Exactly. Uh, yeah. other, like I, mean, I think there's over over 100 known allergens, but there's 14 on the list. So, yeah. uh, you know, and that's before we ever look into the alternative proteins 
uh, and you know studies still have to be carried out to see whether a lot of alternative proteins uh, have potential to cause allergy so you know uh, it, it probably takes time for the legal legislation to catch up with with the science <laughs> you know um, unfortunately right. yeah but, but but check out the databases that are there that's yeah that's, that's, you or you know, know if you have a concern other people have done the work <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, where we does the we need to also remember the um, the clinical side because the clinicians need to be alert to this kind of thing, so that if they diagnose somebody with a you know a prawn allergy, they might at that point need to alert them to other foods that are on the horizon. Um, so there's a role there for much more interaction between the clinicians, the patients, um, if you like, the consumer side and the industry. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, where does the data on the causes of fatal food induced anaphylaxis by trigger in children and others come from? Where does that data come from, uh, Hazel? Do you know? You, it comes, not well, it's a area. paper that's got my name on it. It's, um, um, it's a BMJ paper, so uh, British Medical Journal this year, um, and it's free access online. Um, and I think it came from about February. The first author is Alessia Baseggio Conrado. Okay. Thanks for that. And uh, Maria, do you think that physical chemical analysis of proteins are enough to assess their high probability in risk, of, uh, in terms of the risk of allergenicity? No, I don't. I think you need in vitro methods as well, you know, in animal models, unfortunately, or to develop cell culture methods that could potentially replace the animal models as well. Um, but, you know, in silco and uh, silco methods aren't enough alone, but they're a good starting point, you know. So uh, I know if you recommend four steps, and I, I listed them in the presentation. So you look at the physiochemical and the digestibility of the, the protein. Uh, you can use in silco to compare your protein after it's digested or before it's digested to known allergens, then you should have in vitro methods, which usually involve mouse models, but there is a growing kind of area where cell culture has been used instead of, instead of, of um, mouse models, but it's not approved yet. And then you have obviously the, the clinical assessment, uh, you, you know, uh, which probably has to be carried out as well <laughs> before you know for sure. <laughs> All right. So, so uh, I mean, you're talking about re resource requirements there to do all that, really. Exactly. Yeah. So, but yeah. it's, I do really think the Encilco is a good place to start, especially if you know the sequence of your protein, um, you know, isolate, characterize the protein. That's not that expensive now. And then you can just blast your protein against known allergens. And if you have a sequence similarity of greater than 35% over 80 amino acids, uh, it's thought to be an allergen and the pepsin test is also very useful because most allergenic proteins or proteins that cause allergy um are usually resistant to pepsin uh over a 60 minute uh, session so uh, you know treatment with pepsin for 60 minutes so um yeah if those two things are are positive you know if you've positive there it's likely your protein is an allergen i see so, so, so there's a stepwise procedure to follow, really, isn't there? And you, exactly. In terms of elimination or, or going, going forward, yeah. Uh, is there anything known about the allergenicity of, in, uh, just related to that, uh, on the allergenicity of enzymes used in food processing, for instance, not labelled? <clears throat> yes, I think that uh, enzymes, because they're proteinaceous in nature, can cause allergy. Um, so uh, for some reason, <laughs> um, I'm thinking papine. <laughs> I could be wrong. I think the enzyme papine can and cause allergy. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if Hazel can say anything more on that. But from pineapple. Pineapple, yeah. So. Well, I wonder actually anecdotally whether, because pine, pineapple and kiwi, I think kiwi contains it as well. I mean, the reason why we use them with, with gammon is to break down the meat. Yes. And I think one of the um, things with consumption, especially for say children with tender skin is that it's more like a, um, a skin irritation than uh, allergenicity, but it may let the allergen in, I just don't know, but that wouldn't surprise me if that's why that causes a problem sometimes. Right. And then we have another question. Is there a method database available 
for rapid and reference methods for industrial cleaning validation and verification activities with no uh, with known uh, limits of quantitation, limits of detection, etc., suitable to verify cleaning performance. I presume now they're talking about cleaning for allergens. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, there probably is, but it's beyond my expertise, I'm afraid. Maria, you, you... I don't know either, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, there you are. I can look into it and get back to um, it. Just on that note, I would direct that person to the Safe Food Knowledge Network website. Uh, we have uploaded the webinar that was given recently on cleaning and disinfection for allergen control by Peter Littleton from Christine's. Very good and very comprehensive webinar. So there might be some material that you can garner that might be of use. Okay. I'm just checking, do we have any more questions? I don't think we have any more questions, folks. Um, it just leaves me, I'm conscious of the, of the time. We've run slightly over, my apologies for that, but we really had a very good and very robust question and answer session there. Thanks to Maria and thanks to Hazel for two excellent presentations covering a very topical issue and one that's not likely to go away in the foreseeable future. Uh, folks, we will shortly send out uh, an email with a, a link to an evaluation form. We would appreciate it if you could fill that in. Um, it's very quick. You can fill in very quickly um, and send it back to us. And uh, in the next few days, we'll be sending the link to both presentations. And that will be available on the Safe Food Knowledge Network. Tracy has included uh, the link to the Safe Food Knowledge Network. For those of you who are not members and wish to join, I would advocate that you join. It's free to join, very easy to join, and you will be kept informed of future events and webinars and training, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that we carry out, particularly for the smaller food businesses uh, via our Knowledge Network. So uh, Hazel and Maria, thank you very much indeed. Uh, that was a great presentation and well worth it. So uh, thank you, folks. Thanks for joining me and have a good day. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, but thanks for everyone for joining. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks. Thank you. That's good.